Happy Tuesday, everyone. If you're watching this video right now, I want you to email me the name of your favorite TV show or movie to let me know you started watching this video um, so you can get some participation points. So take a moment, pause this video, send me an email at asmith at sheltonschools.org with your favorite TV show or movie name, and you'll get some extra bonus points for making sure that you follow the directions today. So thanks for doing that. Um, we are going to continue on with our lesson. We are continuing this week on learning more about poetry. As we talked about yesterday, this is National Poetry Month. April is known for its poetry. And so we're going to be reading a new poem today and focusing on a little bit more about the alliteration, the structure, and the imagery that is shown in this poem. And you get to have a really fun assignment at the end of today's class. So uh, let's buckle up and get started. So our poem we are going to be reading today is called In Spite of War. And um, a quote from this poem is, in spite of war, in spite of hate, lilacs are blooming at my gate. Now, this poem is going to be talking about nature and it's going to be talking about war. These are two things that we think don't have any relation to each other, but we're gonna see that our poet is going to draw some connections between how nature is working together and how war comes into play with that. So we're going to be seeing a comparison. So some of our goals for today are we're going to use reading strategies to help us understand the poem in spite of war. And we're going to answer some comprehension questions together. We're also going to analyze how specific word choices affect meaning or tone. We're going to analyze how the form or structure of a poem contributes to the poem's meaning. And we're going to determine the figurative meaning of words and phrases. And finally, we're going to analyze how a theme develops over the course of a poem. So we're going to be piggybacking on a lot of the things we talked about yesterday and continuing on as we continue with this poetry unit. So some of the words that we will be using frequently today are alliteration, first person point of view, meter and rhyme scheme. All four of these terms are review, um, but it's important that we understand what they mean. So alliteration, remember this is the use of words with the same or similar beginning sound. So think of Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, the p sound is alliteration. Um, it's the repetition of that beginning sound. First person point of view is the narration of a story by one of the characters using the first person pronouns I or me. So if we see someone saying I or me and they're telling the story, that is first person point of view. Meter is the arrangement of words in poetry based on its rhythm, accents, and the number of syllables in a line. So when we talked about a couple weeks ago um, that every word has a syllable, we're talking about how my name, Andrea Smith, Andrea has three syllables, Smith has one. It's the sound or rhythm and accents on our words. Rhyme scheme is the pattern of rhymes made by the final words or sounds in the lines of the poem. And we use um, a lettering system to represent each new rhyme in a poem. So let's just make sure that we understand the difference between tone, mood, emotion, voice, and meaning. So the exact words a writer chooses in both literary and informational text affects the tone, mood, emotion, voice, and meaning. And authors carefully choose words to ensure that the finished work creates the effect that they intended. So let's look at each of these words separately and then let's talk about how they work together in our poem. So when we're talking about the meaning of something, authors choose words deliberately and carefully because word choice conveys this meaning. Words can be chosen for either their denotative meaning, um, which is the definition denotative, denotative, you guys know I struggle with this word, it's fine. Um, the denotative meaning, which is the definition you'd find in a dictionary, or the connotative meaning, which is the feeling or mental picture created by a word. So we have the literal definition that we find in the dictionary, and then the feelings associated with that word. So those are the two types of meanings that we can get out of a word. And we're gonna see that in poetry. Tone and voice, um, are also convey meaning and authors create both tone and voice through the word choice. Um, so tone is a powerful tool that writers use to achieve a desired goal or purpose. Tone reveals the author's attitude towards a subject or circumstances of a story as well as towards readers. So if someone's tone is angry when they're talking about rain, 
Okay, let's just say we're reading a poem about rain and it feels like they're very angry. This tone of anger is telling us that this person does not think fondly of rain. They get angry by it. Voice is different though. It's similar, but it's different because voice is the author's unique way of expressing an idea and hints at the author's unique personality or the way they see things. So I might have said, make sure that your voice is showing in your argumentative essay. Don't make it sound like something I would write. Make it sound like something you would write. The same thing is with poetry. Each poet has its own particular voice and tone contributes to one's voice. And then finally, um, not finally, another one we have is mood. So mood is one of the most important effects that authors set. And this can create an emotional atmosphere for the piece of writing. To create the mood, authors make deliberate choices about the words and phrases they use. And these are some of the tools that they use. Um, so after, if we look at this example, after an exhausting work week, Susan had finally arrived at the beach. She spread her blanket on the soft, warm sand and lay down. The bright sun beamed down on her face as she drifted off to sleep. She could hear the gentle waves lapping against the shore. Well, if we ask ourselves, what is the mood or atmosphere of this passage? The mood of this passage is calm and peaceful because it's talking about the gentle waves, the warm sand, her laying down with the sun on her face. Um, and the language that creates this mood, like I just said, words and phrases such as soft, warm sand, bright sunbeam, drifted off to sleep, and gentle waves lapping are positive and descriptive. This language suggests that this is calm and relaxed. We wouldn't assume that this mood is chaotic and um, angry because there's no words that contribute to that. So what is the effect of this mood? The mood of the passage creates in the reader a sense of peace about both Susan and the place because the words create a calming effect. And so that's how we view our characters and the setting. Now, emotion, you probably already noticed, ties into all of this. So to achieve their goals, authors make deliberate choices about the language they use, and authors often want to evoke emotions in readers, and their language choices help them do that. For example, authors may strive to create sympathy for or antipathy towards a character. That means they might want you to like your character or hate the character based off of the emotion. Um, it also helps us access the reader's humanity. It makes us feel like we relate to these characters. It engages the reader more fully in the events of the story. We're sucked in when our emotions are grabbed. And it influences the way a reader approaches a topic. It makes them feel a certain towards a way, towards the central idea of a poem. So the poem we're going to be reading today is by Angela Morgan, and this is her pen name. So that means that's what we call her as a poet, but she was actually born Nina Lillian Morgan. She later changed her name to Angela Morgan. She claimed to be born in 1883. However, she was most likely born around 1875. So there's a lot of mystery about Angela Morgan. Her father left the family in 1890, and Morgan then was a newspaper reporter. In 1915, she became a full-time creative writer and poet. In 1915, Morgan attended the International Congress of Women in Holland. She recited her poem, Battle Cry of the Mothers, at the, press, at the Peace Conference. After World War I, she was active in literary groups and she continued writing. In addition to poems, Morgan wrote short stories and a novel, and she had several pieces of writing published in popular magazines. She died on January 24th, 1957. So based off of her history, we understand that she lived during a time of war. So this is going to influence the way she writes about war because she has personal experience with it. So let's talk a little bit about the war that she um, was a part of or lived through. So World War I. The war in Angela Morgan's In Spite of War is talking about World War I. World War I gripped Europe from 1914 to 1918. Allied, allied forces, which eventually included the United States, fought against Germany and its allies. New technology made this war brutal and machine guns mowed down soldiers on both sides. 
Poison gases filled the air, planes for the first time in a major war flew overhead, and this was mounted with machine guns and they killed from a distance, submarines attacked ships at sea, and some 8.5 million soldiers died during this war. Many millions more were wounded and captured or went missing, and civilians also suffered great losses due to fighting disease and starvation. So with all this in mind about World War I and the brutal effects it had, let's practice what we did yesterday with visualization. So as we read in spite of war, we're going to want to visualize the picture that she's painting of this war. So what language will stand out to us as we help create the image in our minds of this poem? Let's find out as we read. So we're going to read this poem twice, and as we read, think about what picture is being painted in your head as you are reading. So let's get started. In Spite of War by Angela Morgan. In spite of war, in spite of death, in spite of all man's sufferings, something within me laughs and sings, and I must praise with all my breath. In spite of war, in spite of hate, lilacs are blooming at my gate. Tulips are tripping down the path, in spite of war, in spite of wrath. Courage, the morning glory saith, rejoice, the daisy murmeth, and just to live is so divine when pansies lift their eyes to mine. The clouds are romping with the sea and flashing waves call back to me, that naught is real but what is fair, and that everywhere and everywhere a glory liveth through despair. Though guns may roar and cannon boom, roses are born and gardens bloom. My spirit still may light at its flame at that same torch whence poppies came. Whereas morning's altar whitely burns, lilies may lift their silver urns. In spite of war, in spite of shame, and in my ear a whispering breath, wake from the nightmare, look and see that life is not but ecstasy. In spite of war, in spite of death. All right, so let's read it one more time and let's make that visual image in our head a little more um, clear. In Spite of War by Angela Morgan. In spite of war, in spite of death, in spite of all man's sufferings, something within me laughs and sings and I must praise with all my breath. In spite of war, in spite of hate, lilacs are blooming at my gate. Tulips are tripping down the path in spite of war, in spite of wrath. Courage, the morning glory saith, rejoice, the daisy murmeth, and just to live is so divine when pansies lift their eyes to mine. The clouds are romping with the sea and flashing waves call back to me that naught is real but what is fair, that everywhere and everywhere a glory liveth through despair. Though guns may roar and cannon boom, roses are born and gardens bloom. My spirit still may light its flame at that same torch whence poppies came. Where morning's altar whitely burns, lilies may lift their silver urns. In spite of war, in spite of shame, and in my ear a whispering breath. Wake from the nightmare, look and see that life is not but ecstasy. In spite of war, in spite of death. So you might notice a couple of these words um, are highlighted in purple. If you were unaware of what they meant, romping just means playing or frolically energetically. Not means nothing and whence means from where. So um, we're actually going to skip these questions and we're going to talk about the analyzing theme development. So remember, theme is the main message a, a writer wants to convey to its reader. In poetry, writers also develop their themes through language and structure that they use to craft their poem. So to analyze a poem's theme, we can follow these steps to help us think about what the message is supposed to be. So first we can identify the subject. What does the poem depict and does the title offer a clue to the topic? Well, we know that in spite of war, that's the title, we know it has something to do with war. And based off of what we know of the author, we can assume that this is about World War I. The poem in its, um, what it's talking about is talking about both uh, nature and war. When we analyze the structure, how many stanzas does the poem have? Does the poet use a refrain and what does it emphasize? What's the rhyme pattern and meter in the poem and how does the structure contribute to the poem's meaning? When we analyze the poet's word choice, what tone or attitude on part of the poet do the words convey? And then finally, analyze the use of figurative language. 
Does the poet include figurative language such as personification, simile, metaphor, hyperbole, onomatopoeias? What images do the words evoke and how does the poem's language affect the meaning and tone? So we already talked about identifying the subject. Let's break it down a little further. So when we analyze the structure, we recall that the poetic structure refers to the organization of lines and patterns of sound within a poem. Poets make careful choices with these elements to ensure that the poems convey specific ideas. So let's analyze a bit of In Spite of War. The poem has three stanzas, two stanzas of 12 lines and one stanza of four lines. And each line has eight unstressed and stressed syllables. This gives the poem a smooth, steady rhythm, rhythmic meter that you can hear when you read the first four lines aloud, like, in spite of war, in spite of death, in spite of all man's sufferings, something within me laughs and sings, and I must praise with all my breath. Everything that's underlined is a stressed syllable. It means that our tongue actually moves more with those words than if the other words. So it's the words that we put emphasis on. Um, so in spite of war, in spite of death, in spite of all man's sufferings, something within me laughs and sings and I must praise with all my breath. The rhythm that is created and the rhymes that are made tells us something about the way that we should be feeling about this poem. So notice how the end rhyme, so the thing that's at the end and underlined, gives the poem a pleasant rhythm and tone, even though the topic is focused on something nitty and gritty like war. Also notice how the end rhyme pairs positive and negative words. So death and breath, those are opposites of each other. If we're breathing, we're not dead. And if we're dead, we're not breathing. And then if we look at sufferings and sings, if someone's suffering, they're usually not singing. And if someone is singing, they're usually not suffering. So we see that this author is pairing positives and negatives together with the rhymes. The smooth, steady, rhythmic feel, the repetition and the end rhyme work together to produce a hopeful tone. The poet wants readers to understand that war does not have to block out or destroy all that is good in life. When we analyze the figurative language in this poem, we have to ask ourselves, how does the poet make use of figurative language to convey her message? Well, in the lines we have already analyzed, the poet infuses her feelings and things of nature with human qualities. She notes that something within me laughs and sings. She said tulips are tripping down the path. Giving human qualities to something that is not human is called personification. So tulips can't trip because they can't walk. But we understand that feeling because probably all of us have tripped at some time. So by giving this tulip um, human qualities, we're able to understand better of what she's talking about. So when we read these four lines from the first stanza, we see that this is not the only personification that's at play. Courage, the morning glory of saith, rejoice, the daisy murmeth, and just to live is so divine when pansies lift their eyes to mine. Can the morning sunshine say anything? No, but we understand that it's telling us to wake up. Rejoice, the daisy murmeth. Can daisies murmur? No, but it's the daisies are almost exuding so much life it's saying to rejoice. Pansies don't have eyes, but when they lift their eyes, we are imagining that the pansies are um, rebirthing or getting bigger or growing. So in this part of the poem, the poet uses three examples of personification, just like I said. So the morning glory says courage and the daisy murmurs rejoice. The pansies lift their eyes to meet the speaker's eyes. This figurative language helps the poet express the idea that people can gain strength and courage from observing nature. Even in times of war, nature continues to renew itself and maintain its beauty. So how does this all work together to tell us about our theme? Well, we have analyzed how the poet structured her poem and chose the words and figurative language to convey a specific tone and meaning. All of these elements helped the poet convey the idea that beauty and hope are possible even in times of war. So let's trace back some of the things we've talked about in this lesson. 
The repetition of the phrase in spite of conveys the idea that even though there is war, the beauty in nature can remind people that there is goodness and positivity in the world. The meter and rhyme establish a soothing, pleasant rhythm. The rhyming also reinforces the differences of the negative and positive words, and that pairing establishes a hopeful tone. It also reinforces the idea that good things happen even in times of war. And then finally, we talked about that the poet reinforces this idea through the use of figurative language. By giving human elements to, these nat to this nature, she underscores the strength of nature in the face of war, just like humans. So we're going to talk, we're going to put some of this uh, tone and feeling and mood that we have talked about today into action with your assignment. So you are going to be working on a Google Jamboard um, that is going to come up with a visual representation of this mood and tone of the poem. So on this Jamboard, you can use sticky notes, pictures, drawings, quotes, song lyrics, or anything to help you show this tone and mood of In Spite of War. So on your assignments, the same instructions are on here. If you are wondering what I'm talking about when I'm saying a visual representation, let's take, for example, the poem we read yesterday. So Nothing Gold Can Stay was a poem that talked about the, um, the loss of time, but also the growth and the starting over process in our lives. And so I gathered a bunch of pictures and quotes that have to do with the elements of Nothing Gold Can Stay. And I created this visual representation with pictures from the internet, but also through sticky notes. So what you are going to do on the first slide of this assignment is you're going to erase my instructions and you're going to go looking for pictures, quotes, song lyrics, anything that will help you show the mood and tone or the subject of this poem on this Jamboard. If you would like to draw your own things, you can do that as well. Either you can draw it on a piece of paper and upload it on here, or you can draw it with the pen over here on your piece of paper um, on your Jamboard. Um, or you can use the sticky notes, upload pictures, text boxes, whatever you want. You just need to cover this whole Jamboard with things that represent both the mood and tone of the spite of, of this poem, The Spite of War, In Spite of War. And so think about the nature. Think about the war she endured. Um, what is this tone that we talked about in our lesson? So work on this. Once you're done, you can turn it in and I can't wait to see your visual representations of In Spite of War. If you have any questions, feel free to comment or send me an email. Bye everyone.